Hello, my name is Jenny Holscher. I am Division Chief of Opinions at the Attorney General's Office. And one of our functions in opinions is to assist the Attorney General in drafting his formal legal opinions, including those opinions that relate to the Open Meetings Act. And the other function that we have is to provide the statutorily required training on the Open Meetings Act. So I'm delighted to be here with you today to provide a basic primer on all things Texas Open Meetings. Now, as many of you know, the Open Meetings Act, which is often referred to simply as the OMA, and I'll probably refer to, the, to it as that today, um, it requires each elected or appointed public official of a governmental body that is subject to the act to take a training course addressing the member's responsibilities under the act. And that training course must be taken within 90 days of taking the oath of office or of otherwise assuming the duties of office if the oath is not required. So along those lines, one of my goals today is to ensure that those of you that are public officials meet this training requirement and that you leave with a basic understanding of your duties and responsibilities and the restrictions that are placed on you by the Open Meetings Act. And in doing that, I hope that you'll also gain some knowledge about why the act exists in the first place. Why did the legislature feel compelled to enact these somewhat burdensome provisions in order to ensure that Texas government is conducted in the open and is transparent? And then my third goal today is to inform you of the potential liability under the act. Now there are circumstances when you as a member of a governmental body or your governmental body as a whole could face individual civil or criminal liability if you violate the act. And I want you to be aware of those circumstances and to understand how you can avoid those situations if at all possible. So we're going to begin with some background information on the act. The act was first adopted in 1967 on the premise that our citizens are entitled to know not only what a governmental body decides, but to know how and why every decision is made. Now, in 1967, the act basically contained one rule, and that was that governmental bodies must have their meetings in the open. Then in the early 1970s, the Sharpstown scandal occurred. And for those of you that aren't familiar with that scandal, a bank attempted to bribe legislators to secure favorable legislation. The Texas Speaker of the House and two of his associates were both convicted of fraud because of that scandal, and a number of other legislators lost their offices in the next election. So because of that scandal, the legislature really beefed up the Open Meetings Act in the early 70s and created a number of additional provisions to ensure that government was conducted in the open. Now the act has been amended numerous times since then as well. Almost every legislative session the act is amended to some extent, some years much more significantly than others. And the act has been interpreted literally hundreds of times by Texas courts and by opinions of the Attorney General. So now the act is 150 annotated pages in the government code. I have split this presentation up today to cover six different topics with regards to the Open Meetings Act. <clears throat> First, we're going to talk about the applicability of the act, to whom the act applies and when. Second, we're going to talk about the notice requirements. The legislature has required that governmental bodies give advanced notice of their meetings so that the public can know what that governmental body is going to discuss and decide. So we'll talk about how you can provide notice in compliance with the Act. Third, we're going to discuss how you need to conduct your meetings so that they comply with the Open Meetings Act. And then fourth, we're going to discuss closed sessions, when they are available to your governmental body and what is required in order for you to conduct a meeting that complies with the Act. And then fifth, we're going to talk about some new technology that is available under the Act for you to have more efficient meetings, teleconferencing, video conferencing, online message boards, ways that you may, able, may be able to meet without all having to meet in one location at once. And then finally, we'll talk about the penalties and the remedies under the Act when a violation occurs. <clears throat> 
Now, I could spend the better part of an hour on any one of these six topics. I know you all don't want me to do that, and I'm going to condense this presentation into one hour, but it's going to be very dense. Um, there's a lot of information. We're going to try and get through it um, as efficiently as possible, but I recognize um, this could be a little bit overwhelming. And I hope that um, if you do leave here with questions, you are aware of our Open Meetings Act handbook. That is a resource that is published by our office biannually, and it is updated every year, every two years after the legislative session. It is an exhaustive resource on the Open Meetings Act, and hopefully if you have questions when you leave today, you will be able to look to that handbook and get some answers beyond what we talk about today. It's, it covers a lot more than what I'm going to talk about in this hour presentation. Uh, I think it's also a useful tool for you to take to your meetings. I've heard a lot of governmental bodies say that when questions arise, um, they look to that handbook to answer their meetings on the spot, answer their questions on the spot in their meetings. So it's available online. You can um, have it with you on your phone or your computer at the meeting, and hopefully that is um, a useful tool for you. So with that, we'll begin our discussion of the substance of the act. And the first topic we're going to discuss today is the applicability of the Open Meetings Act. The act generally requires that all meetings of a governmental body shall be open to the public unless a specific exception applies. And the act expressly defines both the terms governmental body and meeting. So we'll look at each of those in turn. First, we're going to look at what it is to be a governmental body. The legislature has listed the types of governmental bodies to which the act applies. And that list includes statewide boards, commissions, departments, committees or agencies within the executive or legislative branch of government. It also includes local governing bodies, so county commissioners courts, municipal governing bodies, school districts, boards of trustees, county board of school trustees, county boards of education, and local workforce development boards. It also includes the governing body of any special district created by law. And the definition includes a deliberative body that has rulemaking or quasi-judicial power and that is classified as a department, agency, or political subdivision of a county or a municipality. So for example, if a city council has appointed a parks board and that board is responsible for making rules related to city parks with final jurisdiction over those rules, then that board is going to be subject to the act. And finally, the act applies to a limited number of nonprofit organizations and property owners associations. Now, when we talk about who the act applies to and which governmental bodies it applies to, it's also necessary to understand the concept of a quorum, because generally speaking, the act applies only when there is a quorum of a governmental body. And a quorum is defined under the act to mean a majority of the governmental body unless some other law defines that differently. So if a governmental body has a nine member board, five members must be present in order for there to be a quorum. Now it's worth noting in relation to quorum that the number necessary for a quorum does not change when positions on the board are vacant. So if a governmental body has nine members but only seven of those positions are filled, a quorum is still five. It isn't reduced because the number of members is less at that particular time. All right, so we've talked about what it is to be a governmental body and a quorum. Now, the act also applies when that quorum of the governmental body is meeting. So let's talk about the definition of meeting under the act. The legislature has defined the term meeting to include two types of gatherings. The first type of gathering is the one we all commonly think of as a meeting a deliberation involving a quorum of the governmental body during which public business is discussed. Now the other type of gathering that's included in the definition of meeting is sometimes referred to as the staff briefing meeting. And that involves a quorum that has been called by the governmental body at which members receive or give information or ask questions about public business. 
Now it's important to note under this definition that no member of the governmental body has to say a word in order for it to be a meeting. Even if an executive director calls a staff briefing and all members of the governmental body attend and only listen to what it is that that staff member says, that is a meeting and it's subject to the act and you need to follow the requirements of the act for that meeting. All right, there are some exceptions under the act, even when you have a quorum of a governmental body together. The act contains an exception, for instances, when a quorum gathers at a social function unrelated to the public business of the governmental body, or at a regional, state, or national convention or workshop, or at a ceremonial event, or a press conference, as long as no formal action is taken and any discussion of public business is incidental to the event. So for example, if a quorum of the city council happens to attend a high school football game on a Friday night, that is probably going to be considered a social function that is not a meeting. They can even sit together. What they can't do is discuss public business. If a quorum of the city council goes to a football game, sits together, and starts to discuss public business, that is a meeting, and it's a violation of the act because the requirements of the act haven't been followed. Now, I don't want to suggest here that you can't have friendly conversations, but I do want to emphasize the seriousness of meeting in quorums outside of a properly called meeting. There's a 1990 Texas Supreme Court case where the court found that two members of a three-member water commission violated the act when they discussed public business in the restroom during a break from their regularly called meeting. You need to remember this and recognize the discussions of public business need to be kept to the meetings when you are in a quorum. You can talk to each other in the elevator. You can speak to each other when you run into each other at the grocery. I don't mean to suggest that you can't, but you need to understand that your discussions of public business need to be limited to the meetings. If you don't take anything else away from this presentation today, I want you to take the message that you cannot discuss public business in a quorum outside of a properly called meeting. Doing so could um, result in severe criminal or civil liability to you and your governmental body. So with that, let's move on to our second topic today. We're going to talk about providing notice under the Open Meetings Act. The act requires that each governmental body shall give written notice of the date, hour, place, and subject of every meeting of the governmental body. Now with regard to the subject matter, the notice must be sufficient to inform the general public of the subjects that the governmental body is going to consider during the meeting. And I think the best way to analyze this sort of issue is to look at a hypothetical notice and see whether it is sufficient. So here we have a notice for a meeting of the Tejas City Council. It has listed the date, the hour, and the place of the meeting. And then the first subject to be considered is the mayor's report. Does that subject provide sufficient notice of what is going to be addressed at the meeting? No. It tells you who is speaking. The mayor is going to give a report. But that language alone is insufficient as a matter of law to describe the subject matter of the meeting. Now, if this notice listed what the mayor was going to discuss under mayor's report, that would be fine. But the inclusion of boilerplate language like this by itself is insufficient under the act to provide proper notice. We regularly see meeting notices that, in, that include language like old business or new business or executive director's report. All of those, all, uh, the use of boilerplate language like that in all of those instances is insufficient under the act. So if your governmental body is using language like that, you need to reconsider your agenda preparation and make sure that you're providing more detail about the subjects that are going to be considered at your meeting. This notice also includes an entry for personnel matters as a subject that will be discussed at the meeting. Does that entry provide a sufficient description of what's going to be addressed at the meeting? Well, that depends. 
It depends on the specific personnel matter that your governmental body is going to discuss. The Texas Supreme Court has addressed on multiple occasions notices that include a description of personnel matters. And according to the court, whether that entry is sufficient depends on whether the matter being discussed is of special interest to the governmental body's constituents. So for example, the court has said that the hiring of a school district superintendent is a subject in which the public has a great deal of interest. So simply noting personnel matters on a notice when um, you're talking about hiring a new superintendent is not going to be sufficient. The same will likely be said of a city manager or of an executive director of a state agency. If that is the subject that you're going to talk about, you need to make sure and identify that position in your notice. Now on the other hand, Texas courts have said that lower profile positions like school librarians, teachers, counselors, or city administrative staff are not subject not the subject of special interest to city residents, such that notice beyond personnel matters is required. So ultimately, whether a notice is going to be legally sufficient to notify the public of your subject is going to be a fact question. But if you're uncertain about how much detail to provide, I always encourage you to provide more detail rather than less. You're not going to get sued by a member of the public because you've provided too much information in your notice about what it is that you're going to talk about. But you very well could be sued if you don't provide enough information and the public is left unaware about the subjects that you're going to talk about at your meeting. And finally, this notice has a section for public comment. Now, generally speaking, a notice that simply lists public comment is going to be sufficient. If you offer public comment, your governmental body most of the time is not going to know what members of the public are going to say in that public comment section, and that's fine. But if you ask members of the governmental body to come and speak on a specific topic, you certainly want to include that in your notice. And if you are aware that a number of members of the public are coming to your meeting to speak on a specific topic, even if you haven't asked them to, it's probably a good idea to go ahead and include that in the notice because that's going to be a significant subject at your meeting that you know about in advance. All right, the Act places um, a number of requirements on deadlines for posting notice. The Act specifies a minimum period of time that a governmental body must post notice before a meeting. And this allows constituents to make plans in advance if it wants to attend the meeting. The general rule is that a governmental body must post notice 72 hours before the scheduled meeting. Now there are two exceptions to this rule. Governmental bodies with statewide jurisdiction must post at least seven days prior to the day of the meeting. And when a governmental body is faced with an emergency or urgent public necessity, the notice of a meeting or a supplemental notice to an already scheduled meeting must be posted at least two hours in advance of that meeting. Now we'll discuss what constitutes an emergency or urgent public necessity later. The Act specifically defi defines that phrase. But for now, simply know that if you have an emergency and you fall under that exception, you have to post notice two hours in advance of your meeting. The Act also sets out locations where a notice must be posted. And applicable to all governmental bodies, notice must be posted in a place readily accessible to the general public at all times during the posting period. So if a city hall is locked at night, and a notice is posted inside City Hall, it's insufficient to meet this requirement if members of the public can't see it from outside. Now the Act has a number of provisions that apply to specific types of governmental bodies and address where their notices should be posted. For example, state governmental bodies are required to submit their notices to the Secretary of State, who then posts notice on the internet. County governmental bodies are required to post notice on a bulletin board in the county courthouse. Municipal governing bodies on a bulletin board in City Hall. And a school district at the central administrative office of the district. To the extent that any of these entities have websites, the Act now requires them to also post notice on the internet. Now we don't have time today to go through the remaining posting requirements for each specific type of <coughs> governmental entity. But if you have further questions about 
the location of meeting notices, and where they should be posted, I refer you back to the Act, to those specific provisions that may address your governmental body. All right, so I mentioned emergency meetings. The Act creates an exception to the 72-hour or seven-day posting requirement in the event of an emergency. And it defines emergency for purposes of the Act. An emergency or urgent public necessity exists only if immediate action is required because of either an imminent threat to public health and safety or a reasonably unforeseeable situation. Now, whether any specific situation constitutes an emergency or urgent public necessity is going to be a fact question, but I want to emphasize that this exception for meetings should be used when these specific requirements are clearly met. This is not an appropriate tool simply because a governmental body realizes within 72 hours of a scheduled meeting that it forgot to include something on the agenda. One Texas court has also said that if the immediate need for action is brought about by a board's decision not to act at a previous meeting, then the need is not due to an emergency, it's due to the board's inaction. And this provision cannot be used to hold an emergency meeting in that instance. There was also one instance where a city tried to use this provision to hold an emergency meeting to terminate one of its police officers, claiming that it had a lack of confidence in that officer. However, the court concluded that a general lack of confidence is not sufficient to justify an emergency meeting and that that could have been handled at a meeting called 72 hours later. So the court cases interpreting this provision make it clear this is a limited exception that should be used sparingly. You must have a need for immediate action and that need must be caused by an imminent threat to the health and public safety or a reasonably unforeseeable situation. If you don't have that situation, then you need to go ahead and post for a regular meeting in your normal posting time. If you have decided that you have an emergency situation that justifies an emergency meeting, then the Act outlines specific requirements for you in posting notice before that meeting. As discussed before, you have to post your notice at your normal locations two hours in advance of that meeting. And in addition, there is a provision in the Act that allows members of the news media to request special notice in the event of an emergency meeting. So if news media have notified you that they would like that notice, you need to make sure that you have notified those news sources of your emergency meeting in advance. And the governmental body must clearly identify the emergency <coughs> or urgent public necessity in the notice or in the supplemental notice. So for example, weather events are often a reason why you might have an emergency meeting. If you are meeting because of a coming hurricane, then you need to make sure and identify that in your meeting notice. Simply note that this is an emergency meeting pursuant to the provision in the act that allows it because of Hurricane Rita, or whatever storm is coming that um, justifies your emergency meeting. All right, the Act also has a provision relating to recessing meetings. A governmental body that recesses an open meeting to the following regular business day is not required to post notice of the continued meeting if the action is taken in good faith and not to circumvent the Act. So if you have a city council meeting that surprisingly runs to 11 p.m., people want to go home and convene the next morning, the Act allows you to do that. You don't have to wait three more days before convening your meeting again. You can meet the next business day without having to post again, as long as you're doing so in good faith and not to circumvent the Act. Now, if a meeting flows into a third day unexpectedly, then proper notice is required before you convene again. Now, of course, if you recognize that your meeting is going to take more than one day, the best practice is to notice that meeting for two days, and then you won't have to get into this sort of situation of worrying about recesses and things like that. If you know in advance, post the notice for the two days, and then you're covered. All right, we've spent a lot of time on notice this morning, 
And um, it's obviously something that the legislature feels strongly about. There are a lot of requirements in the act about providing notice to the public to ensure that they're aware of what it is you're talking about at your meetings. If the public isn't aware that you're discussing a specific item, then they don't know whether to attend and pay attention to that topic. So I wanna wrap up this discussion today by addressing what can happen when a governmental body doesn't provide proper notice under the Act. Any action that is taken in violation of the Act can be void. It's voidable. And there's a case that exemplifies the consequences of not providing proper notice well. It's the Ferris v. Texas Board of Chiropractic Examiners case, and it's a Court of Appeals case that involved a board attempting to fire its executive director. It held a meeting in July and attempted to fire its executive director at that meeting, but it had not properly noticed that topic at that meeting. The executive director thereafter filed a lawsuit alleging that her attempted termination was void <coughs> and she was owed back pay from the time that they attempted to fire her. In December of the following year, so 17 months after the initial attempted termination, the board properly terminated the executive director at a lawfully convened meeting. And the board argued at that point that because it had rectified any prior violations of the act, she shouldn't be entitled to damages. But the court disagreed, and it awarded her 17 months of back pay, all of her benefits during that time, and her attorney's fees, despite that she had gotten a job with another state agency very shortly after she had been terminated. All of this was due to the fact that the board hadn't provided proper notice and had not taken an action in compliance with the act. I emphasize this because there is real civil liability that can attach to violating the act that you need to be aware of. Now what could, have, what could the board have done to avoid this significant liability? Actions taken in violation of the act may be ratified at a subsequent meeting. The board did this, but they waited 17 months to do so. If the board had simply ratified that action at the following meeting, instead of waiting 17 months, their liability would have been limited significantly. But I think there may have been um, a fear that they were going to acknowledge that they had done something wrong. If you recognize <coughs> that you have taken an action that didn't comply with the act, the best practice is to ratify that action as soon as you can. That's how you're going to limit your liability. If you wait, like this board did, you're gonna be potentially writing a hefty check because your actions were voided until they were properly made. All right, so we're gonna move on now from notice and we're going to talk about how to conduct open meetings. And we're gonna start with um, where you should be holding your open meetings. Now, for many of you, it's obvious where you're going to hold your open meetings. You have a room in your city hall or your administrative building that is designated for this purpose. It's where you've always had your open meetings and so this may not be all that relevant to you. But for some special districts and for governmental bodies that stretch into multiple counties, deciding where to hold the meetings is itself an important decision for the governmental body. So open meetings must be held at a location that's accessible to the public. You can't have an open meeting in a building that is gated or that has a coded entry because members of the public wouldn't be able to attend. Generally speaking, your meeting should be within the boundaries of your governmental body. Now there may be some exceptions that apply in specific circumstances, but as a general rule, you should probably be meeting inside the district of your governmental body. Opinions from our office have concluded that a meeting held in Mexico or in another state is in violation of the act, even if that meeting is broadcast over the internet. Members of the public have a right to attend the meeting and having it in another <coughs> state or in another country makes that accessibility um, impossible for many members of the public. And finally, your meeting room needs to be physically accessible to individuals with disabilities. All right, so we're going to talk about conducting open meetings now and what you need to do to conduct your meetings in compliance with the Act. 
governmental bodies may only act through a quorum of their members. So to convene a meeting, you need to have a quorum present. And if members leave, resulting in the loss of a quorum, the meeting should be recessed until a quorum is again present. We're going to talk a little bit about the rights of the public with regard to open meetings. The Act does give members of the public certain rights, including the right to attend an open meeting and the right to record any part or all of an open meeting by video, audio, or other means. Now, a governmental body may adopt reasonable rules to maintain order at a meeting, and those rules could include the location of recording equipment and the manner in which the recording is conducted. But generally speaking, you as a governmental body have no authority to deny a member of the public or the press the right to record your meeting. Now, for many of you, your governmental body is already recording meetings, and you're posting them online or you're um, broadcasting them live, maybe. Um, but in those instances when someone from the public wants to do that as well, you have to give them that right. Now, during the public comment section, it's always possible that a member of the public may raise a topic that isn't posted on the agenda. And the legislature acknowledges this possibility and expressly allows a member of a governmental body to respond to such a comment with a statement of specific factual information or a recitation of existing policy despite that such information was not noticed. So this provides a little bit of cover for you to at least provide some very basic response to a member of the public that has raised a topic that you didn't provide notice for. But any deliberation or decision about the subject of an inquiry that wasn't noticed must be limited to placing that subject on the agenda for a subsequent meeting. All right, we're going to move on to broadcasting open meetings and when that is required. The Act authorizes all governmental bodies to broadcast their open meetings over the Internet, and it now requires some governmental bodies to do so. In particular, the governing boards of general academic teaching institutions and the governing boards of junior college districts with a total student enrollment of more than 20,000 must broadcast any regularly scheduled meeting of the governing body. In addition, a number of governmental bodies are now required to make a video and audio recording of each regularly scheduled open meeting that is not a work session or a special called meeting and make that recording available on the internet within seven days of the day the recording is made. So those governmental bodies include the governing body of a home rule municipality with a population of 50,000 or more, a county commissioner's court for a county that has a population of 125,000 or more, a school district board of trustees for a school district that has a student enrollment of 10,000 or more, and then certain other transit authorities or departments. All right, so that wraps up our discussion of open meetings. Now we're going to move on to closed meetings. As we discussed at the beginning of this presentation, the general rule under the Open Meetings Act is that governmental bodies must conduct their business in the open. However, the legislature has recognized that there are instances when there is a legitimate reason for excluding members of the public from deliberations. And there are specific statutory exceptions that allow a governmental body to meet in closed session. Within the Open Meetings Act itself, there are more than 25 provisions that authorize closed meetings in certain circumstances. And outside of the Act, the legislature has enacted additional statutory exceptions to allow specific state agencies and specific types of governmental bodies to meet in closed session in certain circumstances. So for, as one example, um, the Board of Pardons and Paroles has an exception that allows it to meet in closed session to interview an inmate or counsel that inmate that is a part of TDCJ. Now I'm not going to go through all of the many exceptions that exist out there for closed meetings, but I do want to focus on a couple that are broadly applicable and that you may use in your governmental body. The first of those is the attorney consultation exception. And this is probably one of the most often used reasons why people go into closed session. <clears throat> Governmental bodies will often go into closed session to have a private consultation with their attorney. 
And the provision in the Act allowing these closed sessions provides that a governmental body may not go into closed session with its attorney except when the governmental body seeks the advice of the attorney about pending litigation or a contemplated litigation or a settlement offer or on a matter in which the duty of the attorney to the governmental body under the Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Conduct clearly conflicts with the Act. Now I've quoted this provision directly because it's important to recognize that this exception in the Open Meetings Act is written in the negative and it is intended to be limited in, spo in scope. It does not allow you to have a closed meeting every time your attorney is present. And it doesn't have you, allow you to have a closed meeting every time your attorney is involved in the conversation. It is limited and you need to make sure that when you go into a closed session under this exception, you qualify under these specific circumstances. There have been a number of cases where governmental bodies have been sued because they go into closed session and then they, they exceed the scope of this provision. Um, recordings of those closed sessions have been disclosed to the public by court order because the session exceeded the scope. So you need to be aware of that and make sure that when you go into closed session it is for one of these reasons. All right, the next exception for um, going into closed session that we're going to talk about is deliberations about personnel matters. So governmental bodies are authorized to go into closed session to discuss certain personnel matters. And the Act allows a closed session to deliberate the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, discipline, or dismissal of a public officer or employee, or to hear a complaint or charge against an officer or employee. Now this exception does not apply if the officer or employee who is the subject of the deliberation or hearing requests a public hearing. It also doesn't apply about to the selection of an independent contractor or a class of employees. So if you are a school district and you are talking about giving a raise to all of your teachers in the district, that's a class of employees. You can't meet in closed session under this exception to discuss that. If you're talking about one specific employee, then you're allowed to do so. And then the final exception that we're going to talk about today is deliberations about real property. The Act allows a governmental body to conduct a closed meeting to deliberate the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property if the deliberation in an open meeting would have a detrimental effect on the position of the governmental body and negotiations with a third person. And there's an interesting case that I want to um, talk about that exemplifies the limited nature of this exception. Um, back in the 90s, uh, Reunion Arena was in the city of Dallas, and the, it's where the Dallas Stars and the Dallas Mavericks were playing. And they, both of those teams were threatening to move to another city if Reunion Arena wasn't significantly remodeled or a new facility built in its place. So the mayor of the city of Dallas appointed an ad hoc committee of members of the city council to focus on this project and figure out how to keep the Stars and the Mavericks in Dallas. That committee held almost all of its meetings in closed session, and a number of those meetings included third parties, specifically representatives of the Dallas Stars and the Dallas Mavericks and real estate owners in the Dallas area. Now the court concluded that some of these meetings were improper. The court emphasized that this exception was created to protect the negotiating position of the city. It wasn't intended for a government to be able to conduct all of its negotiations in private. The court explained that it was certainly proper for the city manager to use this exception to inform the committee or the full city council about the negotiating position of the city but when these other representatives came in, when the representatives from the teams came in, and when the real estate developers came into those meetings, the city's negotiating position was compromised. And that went beyond the scope of this exception, and those meetings were improper under the Act. So this, again, is a narrow exception that you should use with caution. Anytime you are going to meet in closed session, 
you want to make sure that the specific requirements in the statute are met before you go into that closed session. All right, to the extent that you are allowed to meet in closed session, I want to emphasize that those closed sessions are only for deliberation. You cannot take final action in a closed <coughs> session. That has to be done in an open meeting. So if you go into a closed session to discuss a personnel matter, for example, uh, maybe you're going to fire your, you, you want to discuss firing your executive director. The act allows you as a governmental body to go in and have a very candid conversation in closed session about the reasons for doing so, the advantages, the disadvantages, whether that um, a person deserves a second chance. But you cannot conduct the ultimate vote in closed session as to whether or not you're going to terminate that executive director. That has to be done in an open session. Now obviously by the end of that deliberation in closed session, you may have a very good idea about how everyone in your governmental body is going to vote. And that's fine, that's the purpose of a closed session. But you cannot take that next step of taking the actual vote and make, making members of the governmental body record that vote in a closed session. That's an action that has to be done in an open meeting. All right, if your governmental body decides that it is appropriate to have a closed meeting, there are specific procedures that need to, need to be followed in doing so. The notice requirements apply to any meeting, whether it is open or closed. So even if you, don't, even if you know that your entire meeting is going to be in closed session, you still have to post notice and you still have to include a general description of the subject matter that you are going to address in that closed session. As with an open meeting, you cannot begin a closed meeting until you have a quorum present. And the governmental body re is required to first convene in an open meeting before it glows into closed session. The purpose of this requirement of the act is to ensure that the public knows who is meeting in that closed session and who is present to discuss whatever topic it is that you're discussing in closed session. The public doesn't have a right to attend or listen to those discussions, but it does have a right to know who is involved. Now, once the open meeting is convened, the governmental body should identify the provision in the act that allows the closed meeting. So for example, if you're meeting in closed session to have a consultation with your attorney regarding pending litigation, you need to state in open session that you're meeting under section 551071 of the government code to have a consultation with your attorney. And finally, a governmental body must keep either a certified agenda or a recording of most closed sessions. The exception being for closed sessions for a private consultation with your attorney under section 551.071. So let's talk about what is required on that certified agenda or recording of a closed meeting. If you decide to keep a recording of the closed session, the only procedural requirement that you need to follow is that the presiding officer must include an announcement at the beginning and end of the meeting indicating the date and time. Now, if you instead choose to keep a certified agenda, there are a number of requirements that you must include in that agenda. First, you have to have an announcement by the presiding officer at the beginning and end of the meeting indicating the date and time. Then you have to have a statement of the subject matter of each deliberation. And then you have to have a record of any further action taken. Now I emphasized, you can't take any final action in a closed meeting, but you may table the discussion for another meeting. You may um, set up a committee to look into the issue further. Any of those sorts of actions that you take need to be recorded and placed on that certified agenda. And then finally, the presiding officer is required to certify that the agenda is a true and correct record of the proceedings. Now, if you keep a certified agenda or a recording of a closed meeting, you should know that the act makes those confidential. They may not be disclosed to a member of the public except by court order. So if you have those, you need to make sure you're putting them in a safe, locked place so that only members of the governmental body and the necessary staff have access to those. Now any person, whether a member of the governmental body or not, who knowingly discloses a certified agenda or a recording of a closed meeting to the public 
commits a Class B misdemeanor. And all certified agendas and recordings must be maintained and preserved by the governmental body for at least two years. And obviously, if they become involved in litigation, you need to keep them through the course of that litigation. So let's talk about who can attend a closed meeting. Only members of the governmental body have a right to attend a closed meeting, except that if you are meeting under Section 551.071 for a private consultation with your attorney, you should probably make sure that your attorney is there. But otherwise, only the members of the governmental body have a right to attend. An executive director does not have a right to attend a closed meeting. A city manager doesn't have a right to attend. Um, you obviously, as the governmental body, have the discretion to allow those members of your um, governing body to attend, but they do not have a right to. It's up to you to decide who is there. Any officer or employee whose participation is necessary to the matter under consideration is permitted to attend a closed meeting. Now that sums up our discussion on closed meetings. Moving on to our next topic, we're going to discuss holding meetings by teleconferencing, video conferencing, and then using the online message board. And there is an implicit acknowledgement in the act that sometimes it's difficult for all members of a governmental body to meet in one room at the same time. And the legislature seems to be trying to make a real effort to make this easier for you so that you can be more efficient as a governmental body and on occasion have meetings even when you can't all be in the same place at once. So first we'll talk about teleconferencing. Any governmental body that is meeting to discuss an emergency or public necessity, as that phrase is defined in the act, may hold its meetings by teleconference if it's difficult to get all members of the governmental body in the same place at once. Now in addition, there are specific governmental bodies that may hold some other meetings by teleconference, including governing boards of the institutions of higher education and governing boards of junior college districts, among a few others. And finally, any governing body may use a conference call to have a consultation with its attorney, either in public or in a closed session. Now in each instance, when the act authorizes a governmental body to meet by teleconference, it also includes specific technical and procedural requirements that must be followed. So you'll want to make sure you refer to those provisions in the Act to make sure you're complying with them. Now the legislature has recently enacted a provision that allows governmental bodies to meet by video conference call. They actually enacted two provisions at the same time in the same legislative session. In order to meet by video conference call, a number of requirements must be met, and you'll want to make sure you look to the specific provisions of the Act so that your governmental body um, is following the requirements that are applicable to you. But generally speaking, a video and audio feed of the remote member's participation must be broadcast live at the meeting. The member of the governmental body that is presiding over the meeting must be physically present in the meeting space that is open to the public. And depending on the type of governmental body, a quorum may need to be present in that space as well. You also have to have a camera and a microphone available for members of the public, and there are specific notice and recording requirements as well. So if you decide to hold a video conference, refer back to section 551.127 of the government code to make sure you're complying with all of the requirements of that provision. And finally today, I want to, in talking about this technology that is available to you, I want to talk about the online message boards. The legislature has recently amended the act to allow members of a governmental body to communicate about public business and policy using an online message board. Now the act states that this sort of communication does not constitute a meeting in violation of the act as long as you're complying with the requirements of that provision. So you can communicate if you're a member of a governmental body, you can communicate at home, on your sofa, on this online message board, anytime you want with other members of your governmental body without violating the act. 
Now, a governmental body cannot take a vote or any final action on an online message board. Its purpose is only for deliberation, but it can be a useful tool for deciding what topics your governmental body might want to address at a meeting or gauging the interest of members of your governmental body in certain topics. The Act also establishes a number of technical requirements for using an online message board. The message board has to be viewable and searchable by the public. It has to be displayed in real time and viewable online for 30 days after it is posted. And it has to be maintained offline and archived for six years. Now the message board has to be owned and controlled by the governmental body and prominently displayed on the governmental body's primary internet web page. The authority to use these online message boards is new, and I know of only a handful of governmental bodies that are currently using them. If you're not one of these bodies and you're cur curious to see one in action, I encourage you to look at the City of Austin's website. Uh, they, on their main web page is a link to the City of Austin Council message board, and you can look and see how at least one of these message boards is being used by a governmental body and determine whether or not that's something that your governmental body should consider as a way of conducting its business. And along the lines of the message boards, I want to emphasize also what the statute has not authorized. It has not authorized communications between members of a governmental body on other social media outlets that are not controlled by the governmental body. I know a lot of us use Facebook, we use Twitter, Instagram, different social media outlets like that. And as a member of a governmental body, I want to warn you to be cautious when you're using these social media outlets. As a public official, you need to be aware that if a quorum of a governmental body is weighing in on, on an item of public business on an individual's Facebook page, that could be considered a meeting, and it would be a, a legal meeting in violation of the act. So I don't want to discourage you from using Facebook, but I want you to be cautious when you're doing so and be aware that there is risk out there if your settings are such that anyone can respond to comments that you post on your own page. And with that, that provides a good segue to discussing the penalties and remedies that are available under the Act if there are violations of the Act. So we're first going to discuss the criminal penalties that exist under the Act. There are four instances in which criminal penalties may attach to violations of the Open Meetings Act. If you knowingly fail to keep a certified agenda or a recording of a closed meeting, you can be charged with a Class C misdemeanor. And if you knowingly disclose to a member of the public a certified agenda or a recording of a closed meeting, you can be charged with a Class B misdemeanor and could also be subject to civil liability if the disclosure injured or damaged another person. Now these offenses are punishable only by fine. So they deal with the certified agenda and the recording. You want to make sure you follow those restrictions in the Act to ensure that you're not subject to any criminal liability. There are also two offen offenses that are punishable both by fine and confinement. The Act makes it an offense punishable by a fine and or confinement to knowingly call or participate in a closed meeting that is not permitted under the Act. So this is one of the reasons it's very important to ensure that when your governmental body decides to go into a closed session, you are certain that you have statutory authority to do so. You're not going into closed session to talk about some item that is very tangentially related to legal issues and your attorney's present. You want to make sure that you have very express authority to go into closed session and you're not going to be accused of having an unauthorized closed meeting. Now apart from these criminal provisions in the Act, it expressly provides for civil remedies as well. And we talked about how any action taken by a governmental body in violation of the Act is voidable. Individuals may sue to prevent threatened violations of the Act as well. Now we discussed the scenario where the executive director's termination was taken in violation of the Act and how the court voided that action. In the same way, if your meetings are not accessible to the public, if you haven't taken 
if you haven't provided proper notice, if you've forgotten to post notice or it's been posted in the wrong place, any of those accidents, mistakes, whatever you want to call it, could result in the actions taken at your meeting being voided. So you want to make sure that you are following all of the requirements of the act because there really can be some significant financial um, problems that will result if you don't follow the requirements of the act. During the past session, the legislature made a number of significant changes to the Open Meetings Act. And while a majority of the act remains the same, new legal requirements exist for certain governmental bodies with regard to providing public comment, conducting emergency meetings, and deliberating through a series of communications. The Office of the Attorney General is in the process of revising the Open Meetings Act training to address these changes, but in the interim, we provide this legislative update to educate governmental bodies and the public about the recently enacted provisions of the Open Meetings Act. The first significant change involves the enactment of House Bill 2840, which requires all local governmental bodies to allow for public comment by each member of the public who desires to address the body regarding an item on an agenda for an open meeting. So this new law, which is found in section 551.007 of the government code, applies to county commissioners courts, municipalities, school district boards of trustees, as well as other local governmental bodies and nonprofit organizations that are subject to the act. The law allows a governmental body to adopt reasonable rules regarding the public's right to address the body, including rules that limit the total amount of time that a member of the public may address the body on a given item. However, the governmental body may not prohibit public criticism of the governmental body during this public comment section. Now, prior to the enactment of this bill, the Open Meetings Act did not require any governmental body to provide for public comment at their meetings. While many governmental bodies chose to do so, it is now a requirement under the Act for local governmental bodies. It does not apply to statewide governmental bodies, so those entities are not required to provide public comment but the entities to which this provision applies should ensure that they provide members of the public an opportunity to address the governmental body consistent with the requirements of section 551.007. The next significant change that the legislature addressed involves emergency meetings. So the legislature modified the procedures for holding a meeting to respond to an emergency. Senate Bill 494 changed the amount of time notice must be posted before a governmental body may convene a meeting to deliberate or take action on an emergency item. So the law previously required a two-hour notice, but the legislature shortened that requirement to a one-hour minimum prior to holding an emergency meeting. The legislature also clarified the meaning of the phrase reasonably unforeseeable situation by providing examples of what that means, including a fire, flood, earthquake, hurricane, tornado, wind, rain, or snowstorm, power failure, a transportation failure, or an interruption of communication facilities, an epidemic, or a riot, civil disturbance, enemy attack, or other actual or threatened act of lawlessness or violence. So if any of those events occur and require immediate action, the governmental body responding to those events can meet under the emergency provisions of the Open Meetings Act. And finally, the legislature enacted Senate Bill 1640, revising Section 551.143 of the Act, one of the provisions creating a criminal penalty for a violation of the Open Meetings Act. Now previously, this provision prevented circumventing the Act's requirements by meeting in numbers less than a quorum for the purpose of secret deliberations in violation of the Act. In February of 2019, the Court of Criminal Appeals struck down the previous version of Section 551.143, concluding that it was vague and unclear about what conduct it prohibited. So in response to that decision, the legislature revised Section 551.143. And that section now prohibits a member of a governmental body 
from knowingly engaging in at least one communication among a series of communications that each occur outside of an authorized meeting and that concern an issue within the jurisdiction of the governmental body, where individually the communications constitute fewer than a quorum, but the members engaging in the entire series do constitute a quorum. Now for such conduct to be considered a criminal offense, the member of the governmental body must have known at the time he or she engaged in the communication that the series of communications involved or would involve a quorum and would constitute a deliberation once a quorum of members engaged in the series of communications. As before, this conduct is a misdemeanor offense punishable by a fine of between $100 and $500, confinement of between one and six months in jail, or both. Like the previous version of this section, this new bill is intended to ensure that deliberations about public business occur in an open meeting and not behind closed doors through multiple separate communications, none of which the public has access. So remember, the purpose of the Open Meetings Act is to allow members of the public to observe and understand the workings of its governmental bodies. By conducting deliberations in open meetings, governmental bodies can guarantee they serve that purpose. So in conclusion, these three bills represent the most significant changes to the Open Meetings Act made by the legislature during the 86th legislative session. And on that note, I'll tell you about one more requirement of the Act. Um, the Act requires that a governmental body maintain and make available for public inspection a record of its members' completion of Open Meetings Act training. So if you've viewed this training in, fuel, in full, excuse me, you may obtain a certificate of completion for the training by going to the Attorney General's website. Under the Open Government tab, you can scroll down to the Open Government training. And on the left side of the screen, there is a link to print course completion certificates. The access code to obtain your certificate is TXOMA873. I'll say it again, TXOMA873. Once you have printed your certificate, you should give that to the person within your governmental body that is responsible for maintaining those records. And if you don't have a person in your governmental body that is responsible for that, you need to set up a system so that if a member of the public does want to access these records of proof that you have attended this training, they can easily do so. All right, that concludes my presentation today on the Open Meetings Act. If you have further questions about the Open Meetings Act, I encourage you, one, to look at that Open Meetings Act handbook and also to contact our Open Government Hotline at the Office of the Attorney General. The number is 1-877-OPEN-TEX or 877-673-6839. There are attorneys on hand that are available to answer your questions and provide further guidance on the Open Meetings Act if you have questions that have not been answered today. So thank you for your attention today and we hope that you'll continue to ensure that the state of Texas has open government and that it's transparent for our public. So thanks so much.